Okay. Well, hello everyone and welcome, welcome to this um, webinar on authentication and remote access to e-resources with Simon Inger. Simon is a publishing consultant who works with libraries and publishers and he's going to introduce himself in a bit more detail. So um, just a few housekeeping things. We're recording the webinar and it'll be emailed to everyone so you can watch it later and share with your colleagues. If you have any questions, please, can you put them in the chat box? And we'll answer them either during the webinar or at the end. And if there's any problems such as you can't hear what Simon says or anything like that, just let us know as well, because we can't hear you. Um, okay, I'll hand over to Simon. Thanks so much. Okay, um, thanks Rami. Um, yes, my name's Simon Inga. I've, um, I've been working in um, journals really for about 30, whatever it is, 32 years now. Um, and uh, a lot of that time I've been working in the technology area. Um, I uh, worked in the 19, uh, early 1990s on early internet products with libraries when I worked at uh, Blackwell's subscription agency. Um, I uh, started a company which provided services to publishers to get their journals online for the first time uh, in 95. Um, just really when the web started um, and uh, ran that company for a number of years. I've been working as a consultant for the last 16 years or so, um, working with publishers, large and small, for profit, not for profit, working with um, national libraries, running training courses because um, a lot of what I've done has been working uh, with publishers um, to understand how their content gets delivered and what the barriers are to getting it delivered and how libraries work to uh, access the content that they produce. Um, so I've been working in online discovery and, and understanding authentication uh, really since about 1997. Um, uh, so I have a long, long history of understanding how these things are built. What I'm gonna to do today, um, is sort of take you through a little bit of a, a history really and also of how we got to where we are today um, with authentication um, and what everybody is trying to achieve. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is start uh, here with a very big chart uh, of everything that's going on. I'll, I'll start at the right hand side these are just examples of publishers, uh, societies, um, and larger publishers. Just examples to say this is the content over on this right hand side. Um, and that content um, is uh, visible in different places. Oh, oops, I'm sorry, that didn't, wasn't supposed to happen. Um, that content is visible in different starting points that the users. The readers of content might use. So um, obviously we know about Google Scholar as being a place where people will frequently start doing a search when they're looking for content, but also there's products like PubMed and then products that libraries often buy as well, whether they are library technology pieces like Ex Libris products or ProQuest products like Summon and um, uh, and, and like EBSCO discovery services and so on. But also things like abstracting and indexing databases, chemical abstracting service, web of science and many others. So these are kind of library acquired starting points, if you like, these are public ones. And then of course there's all social media, whether people have written a blog on WordPress or, or there's a tweet about a, a document as well. Now the interesting thing is that these starting points tend to lead people through a library technology uh, area and the library technology then directs people on to the content. Um, and obviously there's an authentication layer which goes on in between these two points um, for a lot of the content on this arrow. I did it, we drew a different arrow that goes past authentication for open access content. I gave some examples, Frontiers, Plasters, Publishers, but also you've got 
uh, organizations like uh, uh, that are preprint servers like BioArchive. So there's no authentication needed there. And likewise, um, people will attempt to come from a space which is not from within the library, whether it's a tweet or a Google Scholar, and come directly to subscription materials. And somehow you've got to make an authentication layer that allows these people to get here. And these people are obviously your patrons, your people, your readers from, from within your institution. So that's um, uh, sort of the big roadmap. But what I want to do now is just look at this authentication layer um, and discuss how we got to where we are today and then look uh, later on about accessing open access content as well. So the purpose of authentication, um, the user authentication verifies whether a user belongs to or is affiliated with an institution, society or other body, whether it's a student or researcher within a university, someone affiliated with a hospital or any other kind of affiliation you're trying to prove uh, to, to associate. The process does not have to identify the user as such. Um, it, it, and a lot of what we do in our industry keeps the reader anonymous um, as, as, uh, in, in terms of their relationship with the publisher. So that's one of the, the big things that are going on. So why do we authenticate? Um, well, the obvious one is access control because without authentication, we can't work out who is allowed to come in and who isn't. But actually there are others as well. Um, usage statistics um, is, a is a major one. Um, of course, as a library, you can't get statistics of the usage of a journal if you don't, if the person that's measuring that doesn't know where the reader has come from. So the authentication process is, is the piece that, that creates that. I've put this other piece here, user context. Um, for those of you who are using link resolvers and, uh, and so on within a library environment, then obviously there's an authentication piece needed in order to be able to send the reader to the right link resolver at the right university or hospital or institution. The last of these is the least important, um, and that's personalization. And I say it's the least important because it's the thing that's used the least. Um, are in, in terms of these four. Um, it's, it, it can be important to the individual, but often it means two levels of authentication, which is obviously quite confusing. One level of login that gets you to the uh, resource, and then a separate login, which allows the resource to record things about you as an individual. So I won't be talking much about personalization today. Um, that's just an extra level of complexity we don't really have time for. So I'm just going to do this. I've got this brief story of authentication here. Um, we'll come back to all of these points as we go through. But really, um, we started out with passwords for individuals to access resources. And that was obviously very simple. Um, but library acquired content uh, required a simple way of doing site-wide access. And instead of having 10,000 usernames and passwords or whatever you might have in a large university, um, it's easier to do something else. And we started using IP addresses instead as an industry. However, we then discovered some limitations, um, certainly shortages of IP addresses, IP addresses that changed, um, some issues with security around IP addresses, and just got old fashioned human error, people just entering the digits incorrectly into publisher systems, or in emails passing this information around. So then we started to get around those limitations um, with more passwords for individuals, um, especially for people who are working off campus, and that's very dangerous, and we'll come back to that later. Or federated password systems, and we'll look at some of those shibboleth Athens um, uh, later. Um, some of those federated systems are too hard to deal with, 
so then we started to use um, single sign-on, which I'll come back to again later, as a way of getting an IP address through a proxy. So that's a, a major route which we'll look at in, in a while. But one of the problems is, uh, one of the main problems that publishers worry about is Sci-Hub as, as an organization which um, uh, tends to break into proxies and, and use that data to um, steal effectively publishers uh, articles um, and that uh, so because of that publishers started to push for something more secure um, and that's uh, this whole project called RA21 which we will look into again later one of the problems with RA21 is it in order to to sort of plug the gap if you like um, to, to make it the whole system more secure, we need most of the world to adopt it. And so I personally think that that is quite unlikely. So um, we're, what we're going to do is talk, work our way through all of this uh, over the next uh, uh, 45 minutes or so um, uh, and see where we get to. So there are some conflicting needs in the market. Um, what do libraries want? They want something that's very simple because they don't want it hard for their, their readers. They need it to be compatible with any library technology they have in place, especially link servers. And libraries don't have too much concern about security of publishers' work, but some. Um, and that's you know reasonable because to some extent it's not the library's problem. What the publishers want is it for it to be as easy as possible for the reader to get there and, and consume it. Because what they want to do is show high usage and that their products are good value. Um, but at the same time, they want the maximum security so that nobody can steal it. Um, and there are problems that are going on with shared login details, phishing where, where uh, organizations steal the login credentials, holes in the IP address, uh, fabric that are existing and, and easy ways of breaking into some proxies. So publishers worry about all of those parts, but at the same time recognize they need to keep it um, as, as, as easy as possible for, their, their, for the readers. So it's a, it's, a, it's a conflict. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, passwords generally. Um, so I'm going to talk about non-federated and federated passwords. Um, so what I'm talking about here, really, there's two flavors of password out there. There's the, there's the password that the user, the reader, needs on a publisher website, um, where, where that is maintained by the publisher. And that, of course, is difficult for the reader because you end up with different login details for every resource. And of course, we all have that every day anyway um, in our lives because we all have way too many usernames and passwords on so many different systems uh, on the Internet. Um, but the, what happens, of course, is if you've got different logins for every resource, is you write them down um, and then they stop being very secure after a while. Um, and the other thing that's often done is that passwords are shared for site-wide or off-site access. Um, but sometimes they are the only way. Um, and I've definitely come across passwords for libraries, not even in the same continent as the library was, that I've discovered that people knew passwords to other libraries, uh, collections, um, right across the world. So these shared passwords are also dangerous. And there are websites where you can go and find these shared passwords as well. So it's not very good um, for the publisher who's trying to protect themselves. But it's also not really very good for the library if their data, their credentials, uh, even just some of their credentials, um, wander around the world. Not least because um, the, for that particular library's usage um, their statistics start to look really, really good as you're getting thousands and thousands of downloads, um, but not from their own student. Um, but they wouldn't know that if their if their passwords have, have, have walked around the world. So of course it makes it harder for a library to understand where its budget is going 
um, if, if uh, others around the world are using the content it has paid for. Now, the idea of federated um, uh, uh, sign-on is that the institution itself um, holds usernames and passwords, and that's the same username and password that is used for, probably to log on to the network, to read email, and everything else within the, the institution. And the great thing about that then is that um, as far as the reader is concerned, they have the same login credentials for every remote system they access, whether that's Elsevier or Wiley or anybody else. Um, and there's much less risk of sharing um, because uh, clearly if that's also your username and password for your email, you're less, li less likely to share it with friends or, or, or even strangers, of course. Um, but if they are shared or stolen, they end up giving access to a lot more. So we'll come back to that again uh, in a bit more detail, but the, there are definitely two sorts of password uh, out there. This, this second group here is definitely the kind of way that most institutions are trying to build their logins. And this is a more old fashioned way and, and harder to police and secure. So let me talk a little bit about the very basics of IP authentication. Um, the way that um, it was, the, the internet was set up originally was to have every computer in the world to have its own IP address. Um, but there just aren't enough IP addresses for all the machines that need them. So what we have now is uh, local networks where computers have their own IP address and um, a gateway um, to the rest of the world out here. And the gateway really is a very simple device. All it is is a device that has an IP address for, its, for the internet and another a different IP address for the internet, um, for the outside world. Now that's just an example number, of course. Um, there's, you know, uh, and, and uh, an institution would, would probably, probably have a whole range of these uh, numbers. But the, 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 the idea basically is that um, anyone here going through their institution's gateway to the outside world ends up being seen as having an IP address from the gateway. And then the publisher's site will see that IP address down there and say, um, well, this is, uh, I can identify this institution from this IP address, and now I can work out whether they're a subscriber or not. And that's a really, if, if when it works, and where there are plenty of IP addresses in the world, that's a really great and simple method, um, and works very, very well. And works extra, extremely well in, in uh, North America and, uh, and, and most of Europe. Um, to where, where there are enough IP addresses. Um, but uh, the internet was not created very equally and there's a shortage of IP addresses elsewhere. So there are, I, this, the way of doing IP address authentication has a, a number of pluses. Uh, certainly it supports site-wide access and anonymous access, but a number of disadvantages that we've talked about already. Um, the policing of it is, is hard and there's no easy way to check it. Um, I'll come back to one solution there. Um, there are holes in, in proxies, which I'll come to in a minute. They sometimes change and they're also sometimes shared gateways across multiple organizations. So you can't tell the difference from one organization's IP address to another. That's, that's quite common. There's a number of places that that, that happens. Now, a proxy um, is essentially a method of getting somebody out here that's not part of the internet to log in to the gateway or a machine associated with the gateway to give them an IP address the same as everybody who is on site. So here's my on-campus users here. Here's my external user. By logging into the proxy, I get an IP address that if I go into the internet works, and I get an IP address that if I go into the internet, it works as well. 
and I look, so wherever I am in the world, I look like I'm part of the institution and to a publisher sitting out here, I look like the same as anybody else who is on site. Um, it's hard, to, it's reasonably hard to tell the difference. There are ways of, of tracking it, but mostly for authentication purposes, that's what a proxy is doing. They're giving the person who is somewhere else in the world an IP address that they can use that makes them look like they're on campus. Um, so some more IP address problems. So publisher databases uh, have been shown to have many errors. Um, and that's just years and years of, of growth of these databases. Um, uh, and, and data entry problems apart from anything else. Um, but also over the years, um, there's also been corruption and crime. Um, people pretending IP addresses are part of another university's IP addresses so they can get free content uh, and so on. So these, all these errors, and they're huge. I mean, I think um, uh, some major publishers went through their records and did an audit and realized that up to 50% of their subscription records were wrong. So it's a, it's a very widespread problem. So these errors lead to unauthorized access, which you know, on one hand, you don't need to worry about, but this is the one that's damaging for libraries. It gives you possibly incorrect, in other words, higher usage stats, statistics for your resources. And also double counting on statistics. The, the statistics rules say um, that if you're not sure which of say two institutions are trying to access your content, you count it as both. So we end up double counting on statistics and each institution would get a hit when in fact it's just you know, a problem with the IP addresses. Now there is a, a, an industry solution out there and you may be starting to see uh, information about it. There's, there's a, a, a solution called IP registry and that's been in the news just today actually because they've signed a deal with OCLC who run Easy Proxy, and what Easy Proxy is going to do is check the IP addresses um, of the institutions before it lets people through to make sure there are no um, uh, no known hackers, um, you know, and thieves' addresses and so on coming through. So that's quite interesting. That because that makes a big step to make Easy Proxy um, uh, uh, more secure. Um, uh, so that's quite interesting. The IP registry, the idea is that uh, librarians around the world come online and, and log their uh, IPs with the system so that only valid IP addresses end up in publisher systems. So a little bit before I leave IP addresses, um, I'm just going to move on to IPv6. So the IP addresses that we normally use are um, IP version four, ISA Internet Protocol version four. We're now gone, the world is moving to IP addresses version six. And um, there, the, for IP address, the current IP address range allows for 4.3 billion IP addresses, which is not enough evidently for our world um, because lots and lots of devices need them of course, as, but also the world was not created terribly equally with IP addresses. But IP, IPv6 has uh, an awful lot of IP addresses, 340 billion, 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 billion IP addresses. So it's going to be much harder to run out of that. Um, so the, because there'll be no IP address shortage in the future, it makes this method of authentication more probable that that's the way we're going to be moving. Um, but as some have said, because the, the IP address numbers are longer, there's just more digits to get wrong. Oops, excuse me, I didn't mean to move. More digits to get wrong. So it's more problematic uh, and may lead to more uh, entry errors. But it's um, an important uh, move forwards. And IPv6 is faster than IPv4. And there are lots of other benefits. Lot, most of the world's internet backbone runs on it, even if individual organizations do not yet. Okay, there's a very important method um, called trusted referrer as well of authentication. Um, and 
if I've got the publisher here and I'm a reader here, um, and let's say I don't have an IP address that can be um, uh, authorized by the publisher, uh, recognized by the publisher, and, I, I, and, I, and the publisher doesn't want to do individual usernames and passwords because we've said that's quite dangerous. There is another way of saying, um, um, of watching which websites that people come from. So th this relies on um, a feature of your web browser, which whenever you travel across the web from one site to another, you pass to the, the other site the website address that you just came from. So if my reader goes via a, um, a, a website, perhaps a, a, a society's website, on its way to the publisher website, the publisher website can ask my browser where I came from. The browser would reply saying I'd come from that URL from within my society, for example. And the publisher could say, well, it's reasonable to assume that if you come from there, you're a member of that organization and I could let you in. Um, now, there are ways of securing that as well by sending uh, tokens with it, just numbers in the URL to, um, which are unique to the reader. So this is quite an important method, really, trusted referrer. Um, uh, and it's something that you can, if you haven't got a method of authentication that works well with a publisher, you can always ask them if they support this refer trusted referrer um, as well. Now, I'm going to move on to local authentication, which is what I was talking about with federated passwords um, and is actually the concept behind things like uh, Open Athens from EduServe and Shibboleth. Um, and the idea is I go along, here I am as a, as a reader, I come along to the publisher website, but instead of logging in there, I tell the publisher's website what institution I'm from. And it passes me to my local um, uh, institution's username and password database, so my own university or hospital or whatever. I log in there instead, I, I put in my username and password, and then it passes me back to the publisher's website. Now the beauty of doing that is I have a username and password that sits here, but that allows me to log in to lots and lots of different publisher websites over here. And so I never have to send, I never have to remember a different password for each of one of these sites. So um, that's the, the, the concept, um, as I say, behind op uh, Open Athens and Shibboleth. The authentication, the responsibility is passed back to the institution. It's not with the publisher. Um, so it's only a matter of the institution keeping track of who its students are, who its researchers are. And the institution can use lots of different methods itself for doing that authentication. Um, so the user can log in with more familiar credentials like their network username and password, as I mentioned before. And they're more secure because they're kept at home, meaning their home institution where they work. They're not in uh, credentials held in lots of different um, uh, publisher websites around the world. So, um, I'm going to put this diagram up, which is a diagram of Shibboleth, and I, I apologize because this is still the simplest diagram I've ever seen that explains Shibboleth, even though it's obviously quite unpleasant looking. But I'll, make, I'll just explain it very, very simply. If this over here is, says the resource owner, but if that's, say, the publisher, here the home organization, that could be a hospital or university or anything, any or, or a company, but here I am as the reader. What it does is I come along to the publisher's website here and I don't log in here. I say to it, I want to log in at my own institution. And it asks me then to identify through this thing called a WAIF server, asks me, what institution are you from? And that's these steps three and four. Where are you from? I'm, and I tell it. Once I've told this server where, what institution I'm from, it takes me to my institution, which then asks me to log in, and that's that step six. I then 
give my password and that's me logged in. So I'm logged in over here, but this institution knows where I've come from. I've been sent here by this publisher. So it sends me back and it sends me back with a little number. And then what happens here is the, the, this, the publisher's website then actually simply says, just to check, was that a real transaction? Yes, it was. That's really that process at the bottom there. Because it would be possible for a hacker just to do this bit, but it's impossible for a hacker to stop the check happening afterwards. So this is just a security piece. And to make that useful, you can also pass across some user attributes with it. So that can say something like this person is a chemist or a biologist, or they are a professor or they're a student. Um, and, and also you can send an identifying number about the individual to the publisher if you wish in that uh, attribute. And that some publishers, not many, but some are able to make use of that information and do something useful with it here. So if they know it's the same person, even if they don't know who it is, they could say the last time you were here, this is what you read or something like that. Um, so that's that process. Um, this is a video of it happening. So we're gonna see if this actually works. I'm gonna press play and hopefully you will see it do things. So first of all, um, I'm going to say I want to log in by clicking up here. And it, I, my options are then to uh, individual username and password, but I'm going to say I'm going to do Athens or institutional login. And I, by clicking that, it then takes me to a place which is that wave server where it asks me to identify where I'm from. I can do a drop down list or I can start typing in the box. And if I start typing my institution, it then starts giving me a list. I'll scroll down to see that list. I can select that I'm from the University of Oxford. And what it does then is takes me to the University of Oxford login screen. Now, when I'm there, now sadly, I'm not a member of the University of Oxford, or not anymore anyway. Um, so I can put in my username and password and log in. And once I've done that at my home institution, it will take me back to Science Direct. In this case, that's where I started, logged in. Now the beauty of that whole process is I only get to log in here with my university. And also, if I've done it already before I went to the Elsevier site, it wouldn't ask me to, to do that again. Um, it, I only have to log in once whilst I've kept my browser open and it remembers me as I move on. So this is a, a very uh, secure method of doing authentication but it's also um, quite hard for institutions to, to get it set up. So everybody recognizes that there is a, a, some effort in making it work, uh, a lot of effort making it work. So I'm just gonna talk about the single sign-on really. I mean, that is, um, that Oxford University screen was an example of single sign-on and it, it is used extensively, that part of it used extensively in library environments, university environments, corporate environments. Users log in once and gain access to the entire resources of the institution, including their e-resources. Um, and the login process is between the, the, the user and their institution only. And so that single sign-on process is completely invisible to the publisher. They don't get to see it um, uh, in, in, in this or any other scenario we're gonna look at. So going back to that diagram, that's really that part there. So what libraries are striving to build, if they can, is a method by which um, uh, the user ideally does that login process before they go to the publisher website. Um, and then they're not asked to do it again. The other complicated part of the process of Shibboleth is, is this interaction. It's confusing for the user. If they go there, they've got to click a button to say they want to do a certain kind of login, say where they're from, and then do the login. If you reverse the process, if you get them to log in first and travel 
with to the publisher website with details of this already, um, then it makes the journey easier. So that's this piece called Institutional Discovery. Um, the idea is you can send people with a waifless URL and some countries have redirector services. So what that means is I can construct a URL for my reader, which takes them to the publisher site. But in that URL, it already says, by the way, this reader is from a certain university. So they're not asked that question anymore. And hopefully if I persuaded my reader to log in before they went on the journey, they won't be asked that question anymore. So by doing that, I can get my reader just to come across to the publisher website without being challenged for anything, apparently. Um, and, they, and they won't see all that other process happen. It'll all be invisible. So the very biggest institutions in the world are aiming for that kind of very seamless um, action within Shibboleth. Um, which then it makes it very, very easy for, for the reader to, to do it. But it is a complicated process. In the world, there aren't that many organizations doing it, really. We're into the, um, probably into the uh, low thousands, um, uh, you know, maybe just a thousand or so institutions doing Shibla um, globally. Now, what's more happening these days is that um, universities are still doing local authentication. So they're using single sign-on or local authentication as a means to log into their proxy. So instead of the user going to the proxy and having credentials to log in there, the proxy goes back to the institution's single sign-on to make sure this user is allowed to use the proxy. And then they go on to the publisher. Now that makes for a much simpler interface between the institution and the publisher, which is IP address based. It also means that they have a very secure method of using the proxy because it's the same credentials the reader would use um, to log in to their email or their local network and so on. So this is a, 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 good, a, a good method. I, I personally think one of the best methods available. Um, uh, and, and of course, the proxy might have just a few IP addresses that it issues, so there aren't that many IP addresses to share with the publisher, which means the publisher is less likely to make mistakes as well. So it's a good method. The other thing is, is that this proxy doesn't have to live in your, on your own uh, site on your own web space or your own institutional institutional network and one common thing that has been happening for a long time is the idea of having a proxy in a different country um, and that really if, um, the easy proxy service that you use as a service I know easy proxy you can either have as technology you install in your library but you can also uh, subscribe to it as a service and and so um, there's a whole range of servers based um, in uh, Ohio in the US and also in Amsterdam in Europe um, and it's been particularly useful for libraries that have uh, perhaps no unique IP address in their country um, in their situation or libraries which are behind maybe a censorship gateway that can't get a unique IP address um, this will allow their readers to log into a proxy in another country and get an IP address and that IP address travels with them to whatever publisher website they're going to and they they end up seeing then that this that obviously the, the, the library has to tell every publisher about this IP address from their proxy um, but that will grant them access. So that's a really very, very powerful um, solution for a lot of libraries and it's very, very uh, uh, popular. Um, and so that's not just um, easy proxy that does that, but effectively um, the uh, products like remote access uh, achieve the same thing as well, um, that same solution. So what's the benefit of this externalized proxy? Um, 
very good for organizations behind a shared gateway to give them a unique IP credentials. That, so that would, uh, there are organizations in the UK that share IP addresses that can use this solution. I, I mentioned um, censorship gateways. This doesn't bypass censorship measures, but it still gives you a unique IP address to use elsewhere. Um, a lot of organizations are subject to changing IP addresses, but if you buy an external one, that doesn't. And it can be used very securely in conjunction with single sign-on. So this is the, one of the, 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 the things that um, uh, publishers worry about. Publishers often worry about proxies because they've heard they're dangerous and are uh, weak and can be broken into. Um, but there are really uh, two kinds of proxies out there. There are proxies with a shared password uh, and they are dangerous. Um, um, for, for there, you do come across these uh, passwords for universities, proxies, all over the place, and that would allow anybody in the world to log in and look like they were on that university's uh, website, uh, uh, sorry, network, um, and be able to access anything that that university had purchased, or often also internal documents. Um, and then the much more secure one is proxies tied to the institutional single sign-on method, and that's much more secure for all those reasons we said the passwords aren't shared, they are personal passwords um, that do other things as well. Now the problem is that many publishers do not understand this, this distinction and they tend to say proxies are bad. Um, so I spend a lot of my time trying to teach publishers about the difference and getting them to, to accept uh, and try to accept this kind, but not this kind. Now, one of the problems, again, is that Sci-Hub has used these phishing techniques uh, to obtain the user credentials of academics in major institutions with lots of subscriptions so that it can go and steal a copy of everything. So that's it. this is still a problem um, that, 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 it, that it very much exists uh, in the market today. I mentioned remote access. Um, that is a, a, a brand name which is doing very well, I understand, especially in Southeast Asia um, and some countries in Africa and, uh, and also in South America. Um, seems to be a, a, a popular solution. Um, again, it's a proxy that, is, that links with the institution's single sign-on. Um, it uh, uh, controls and monitors usage. So the, 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 the reader goes through the remote access portal. So it's very secure for libraries and publishers, um, but it does actually re reduce the number of ways that you can navigate the content. So it also possibly reduces the usage by restricting which routes people use. Um, another initiative that's out there that you may have seen um, is something called Google CASA. Um, so it is possible for a library um, to share its um, subscriptions information um, with Google, with Google Scholar in particular, and that's the, 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 the library links program at, at Google. And if you do that, and if your reader does a search within Google, it will spot um, what institution they belong to and help guide the reader through to subscribed content um, that, that, that the institution subscribes to. There is another piece uh, with Google Cursor as well, which uh, works with some publishers on some of the major platforms. Now, I've mentioned two brand names here, Atapon and Highwire. Between those two, uh, they host that tens of thousands of, of uh, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe 10,000 journals. Um, so they are uh, uh, major uh, service providers to publishers. Um, uh, most of the ma world's major journals are on those platforms, as well as the big publisher ones like Science Direct and, and Wiley Online Library. Even Wiley is, is on Atapon, in fact, and Sage and Taylor and Francis. So, what you can do is Google will also um, apply a personalization layer for you automatically. 
because if you have a Google username and password as an individual, and Google spots that you're part of an institution that can access a title on a publisher's website, Google will kindly remember for you what you did on that publisher website. And so it'll allow you to go and see what you've done. It'll allow you to pick up where you took off. It allows you to access the, the journals when you're at home because it, know, it has associated your individual username and password for Google with your institution's IP address or anything else so that when you've gone home, you can access the content. So that's another way of giving people who are on campus some of the time, but off campus a lot of the time, good access to the content that you've purchased. Um, as long as they f fairly frequently come to the institution to use content, um, then they can carry on using it um, uh, through Google CASA when they, they get home. Simon, can I just ask a question about this? Yes. Is this a free service or does it cost anything? It's free. Free. And what exactly do institutions need to do? Um, Is there like a login? Sign up or? The Library Links program, okay. at, which uh, at Google, and, um, and then upload a list of the titles you subscribe to. Okay. Thanks. I'll look into this. Okay. Um, uh, okay, yes, so some word about RA21. Um, RA21 is an initiative, so it stands for Resource Access for the 21st Century, um, because apparently um, what we're doing at the moment is still 20th century technologies, mostly. Um, RA21, so it's an initiative to make authentication easier and more standardized and more secure. Um, but most projects on focusing on user identities, um, oh, I'm sorry, I've lost half my slide, that, uh, that are, are shared. Um, so it's, so what, what this project, these projects are currently looking to do is make the world more secure, but by trying to build a single database of, of reader names and passwords, which, um, obviously will not work because governments around the world will stop it happening, institutions will prevent it happening um, uh, and everything else. So it's um, uh, at the moment not looking anywhere near as clever um, as, as IP addresses tied to proxies tied to that IP registry that we mentioned earlier, which is a lot easier to deal with um uh and much more likely to see succeed i think so some words about open access um what's going on well why is authentication relevant at all well we mentioned about statistics so libraries still want to know about how much open access content is read so some of the um uh, publishers that publish open access do still uh, provide statistics because they notice things. They don't demand authentication. They do what is called soft authentication. So they look to see if you have an IP address that they understand. They look to see if you've already logged in using Shibboleth or Athens somewhere else today. Um, and they also say, would you like to log in? Um, just to tell us where you're from uh, and so they can log the statistics. Um, so again, for those that do that, they can work more closely by giving libraries statistics, but also can then uh, work with library link resolvers and, and, and so on. So in that context then, um, you know, this, this whole piece here of this journey what are people trying to do? So this authentication layer sits between mostly the library technology and the publishers, but also between some of these other pathways. So the, 
one of the hardest things to do is to, is to get your readers to do what you want them to do and go down the pathways that you want them to do. But if you can get them to go through library technology on their way to a publisher website, then you can control authentication and make it work very well. But if you're less in control and they tend to use Google Scholar more than a, a, a library technology or just follow tweets or bookmarks or anything else, then you have to come up with an authentication method which um, pops up at the right time. Um, and the best thing to do, generally speaking, is to try and get people to do this login process as early as possible in their day or in their work session um, before they do anything else. So if, if you are using, say, a proxy, say, easy proxy or remote access, um, you could get your reader to log in there before they do anything else. And then they could go and use Twitter and Google Scholar and get directly through to the journal content. So for a lot of libraries that have been working in this area for a long time and, and building things as cleverly as they can, what they're trying to do is one of these two routes to content. Here's my reader. Here's the publisher website over here. There's two routes to it, and this one down here is simpler to do, to implement generally. But both rely on trying to get the reader to log in first, before they do anything else, before they go to Google, before they do anything else at all, before they go to library search. If you can do that, that's, that's a big start. Let's go on this path down here. So if you can get single sign-on tied in with your proxy, uh, if you've got one, or just in order to get IP address credentials, however that's done. Then probably if you've got some library discovery, it doesn't really matter whether it's library discovery system or it's Google Scholar or it's an abstracting and indexing database like Chemical Abstracts or Scopus or one of those. Often then, if the library's got a link server, that will, these systems can be made to redirect the link server and the URL takes you to the publisher website. So that's the simplest way and the way that most libraries in the world are trying to do it. And then the even more secure way, probably, but harder to implement, um, is the same single sign-on, but that gives you your credentials for doing the shibboleth process. You then still use the discovery system, still go through the link server, but the link server creates these wafeless URLs so that the, the shibboleth login becomes invisible to them when they get to the publisher website. So this can happen in a different order, but that's not as nice, not as pleasant for the user. So the best way is to get that done in that order. Personally, I still find this route a lot easier to deal with. And as I said earlier, much more likely to be the version that succeeds um, in, in the market in the long run. I mean, unless the RA21 solution does come up with something amazing that the whole world wants to read, uh, love and, and use. So just um, a quick uh, recap really of, of the uh, library, what the library is trying to achieve. Um, so libraries want simple authentication, and the simplest of all is IP addresses. They want it to be compatible with their library technology, especially their link servers. That on its own often forces people down the IP address combined with proxy solution. They want something that's easy for patrons and their readers, which basically means IP addresses, and they're not too worried about security so IP addresses are good enough. From the publisher's point of view, they want the easiest possible user journey, as we said earlier, which basically means IP addresses. They want the maximum security, so they want local authentication solution. So this RA21 may provide a unified solution that works for libraries and publishers, um, which gives the, the security for publishers' content. 
but it would need to be universally adopted to work. But going back, I can see this, the local authentication combined with a, a secure proxy is going to be, uh, the, is a method that's going to be good enough for publishers that they're going to be uh, happy with, I think. So um, that's essentially it. So I would be very happy to answer your questions if you uh, have any, I don't know. I'm not able to see the questions being typed in if there are any. Um, Romy can and is she going to ask me any that, uh, that are there? Thanks Simon. Um, we've got about 13 people on now, but so far no questions. Um, so please, if you've got any questions, pop them in the chat box. Um, in the meantime, I'll ask a question, if that's okay. okay. Um, obviously, given the audience developing traditional economy countries where budgets are tight, um, we always like to look for, you know, as cheap as possible. Um, so I'm definitely going to look in this a Google Scholar option. Um, the, problem with it, the problem with it is that you still got to have, so, the key thing is that the libraries, are, to, to make that work, has got to have uh, a unique IP address. Yeah. Which either because the library has, you know, the institution has its own block of IP addresses mm -hmm. that it can use that are adequate, or that it has purchased some external IP address through one of these proxy services as a, as a service, like, um, uh, like, like Easy Proxy. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, if you've got that, once you've got a unique IP address, then absolutely you can... Um, For uh, remote access, that would be a solution. Or remote access, indeed, yeah. But yeah. either of those would, would do that mm -hmm. and allow you then to go to Google with your list. But yeah. you, <coughs> in many ways, if you've got a product like remote access, I mean, as the name suggests, yeah. that already does give a service of people working from home yeah. So CASA is not as important in that situation. But let's assume you've got a, a static public IP address and you're just looking at an additional solution for remote. Then, then CASA becomes very, very useful. Yes. Yeah. But if you don't have a static IP address, then a service like Easy Proxy or Remote Access would, uh, Remote Access, what, sorry, I'm pronouncing it the same way. <laughs> The product um, would be a solution because they provide um, IP addresses, and that's why we yeah. did sign this agreement with remote access. Yeah. Um, okay, but that answered my question. Thanks. Um, Yeah, and that does take some of, because you talked about the effort that libraries have to go into to make the single sign-on work. And obviously, if you go with a commercial solution like that, it makes it easier in the institution. Obviously, you have to pay for it, but in terms yeah. of effort. Again, it depends where in the institution the work is being done as well. So if, if, if it's being library-led mm -hmm. uh, because the parent institution doesn't have single sign-on, then yes, you, you're going to have to buy into some commercial solution, but then it only makes it easy to do. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, if it's not library led and it's run at the institutional network level, mm -hmm. um, then obviously, you know, you've got to do something that fits in there. Um, yeah. So it, it obviously depends on each organization as to how it is organized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, so don't have any other question. There's a comment from Andrew who says, good presentation. So thanks, Simon. Okay, thank you. Um, let's just wait because he's still typing. Uh, there's some other people just saying thanks for the presentation. It was quite insightful. Yeah, so... If there's no questions, I think we'll wrap it up because I know you've already spent some time on this. So thanks very much. If any questions come up I, um, that I can't answer, I'll, I might get in touch if that's okay. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, thanks, Simon. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, that's it. Okay. okay. Thank Bye. you very much, everybody. Thank you.